with that we are in chapter 10 of Acts. I'll let everybody get there if you're on your electronic or your paper. I like this chapter because um, not only are we going to see one conversion of a Gentile, we're going to see another conversion of a Jew. Okay? Bear with me, Mike. I was just confused. You don't need to be confused. So, we've seen that in the Jewish culture, they weren't allowed to step into a Jewish person, I mean a Gentile's house. They weren't allowed to have nothing to do with them. They weren't allowed to really talk to them. They were unclean. And we're going to see that, um, you see that the Samaritans came, and they were like, oh, that that's kind of cool. That's okay, right? Because they're half Jewish, right? You would say they were had Jewish blood in them. And then you see the Ethiopian in his chariot get saved. You guys all remember that? And then last week when my wife was talking, we read about Saul. He gets saved. Tonight we're going to read about a man that had a form of godliness, but still was he was righteous in what he did, right? And he was still lost. And if we look at other people, and you know, some people say, "Hey, man, keep your religion to yourself." I'm not into religion. Keep your Jesus to yourself. Blah blah blah. I got my own God, and they think that they're doing it right. And the thing is, is they don't have the Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why a lot of people go out and witness in other countries. And that's why we witness in this country. And if God calls you to another country to go talk to other cultures, that's where you'll go. You know, but they don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one Savior. And we're going to see tonight, like I said, you're going to see two conversions. One man being saved, and I'm not going to give up the other till we get to it. So with that, we'll start in 10. Well, we should start in, um, I think it's 42. And it... and it Of last chapter? Yeah. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believers on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. <clears throat> and I think you cover what a Tanner was last week, right? We all know what a Tanner was. He skinned animals. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. I like that right there, that if you see a centurion... They were always spoke of as good men, right? And they helped build synagogues. And you'll see right there that he feared God. You could see people that are fearing God that don't have Jesus, right? You ever seen that? Oh, I believe in God, but I don't believe in this Jesus. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and standing, saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? I want you to stick to that right there when he said he was afraid because these men weren't really afraid of nothing. But I like that that he said, What is it, Lord, to the angel? Keep that in your mind. Right? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. And he sent men to Joppa and sent for Simon. Uh, did I skip some? No. Simon. Yep. Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. 
he will tell you what you must do. And when the angels who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devoted soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. I like that right there, that there was about a hundred men underneath them. Each centurion had about a hundred men, or six hundred men, I think. You know, and um, he could just tell them to go here, go there, but he's telling them specifically to go to Joppa, which is about, I figured when I'm looking on the map, it was about 27 to 35 miles. Now that's on foot. Hmm. You know, and we have a problem riding our motorcycles to go speak to someone 100, 200, 30. You know, some people won't even drive across town to go to a good Bible study or go to church. Just saying. <clears throat> the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. I think that's about, um, the first one was nine o'clock in the morning and the um, other one is about 12 o'clock in the afternoon, correct? And as you see that, you see we're all Christians in this room, right? How many times a day do you pray? Devotedly, right? This dude is a centurion. He votes, he prayers, prays three times a day. The same. I know I sometimes pray continuously all day because I need help all day long. But I'm praying for myself, sorry. Peter went up on the housetop to pray in about the sixth hour when he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open, opened and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descending to him and let down to earth. And you can imagine that's like a big sheet with rope on all four corners coming down. And this is the vision that he's seeing. And you know, this is a trip that he's up there praying on this rooftop that's flat. And they're downstairs preparing food. God knows how to use all this together. Amen. And in it, and in and it were all kinds of four hoofed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creepy <coughs> things, and birds of the air, and a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Remember this. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now what did the centurion say? Yes, sir. said, yes, Lord. What did Peter say? Not so. How many times has Peter said this if you read in the Gospel? He said, the Lord said, I will be crucified, I'll be blah, 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 and I forget the whole thing, in Jerusalem. And Peter said, Lord, not let it not be. <laughs> and, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Now this is oxymoron right here, isn't it? This is, you don't call someone Lord and tell them no. Right. Amen? Unless you're Peter. Unless yeah. you're Peter, exactly. Right? Unless you're knucklehead Peter again. Right? This is after the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. Peter says no again. Filled with the Spirit. Flesh gets in the way. No. I'm super clean. I will never, Lord. We're going to learn. So Peter said... No, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. How many times have we seen this right here? Like, I've had people come into my shop, I've had people trip on me and say, there is no way you guys are Christians. Have you ever had that happen to you? 
there's no way you're Christians. And you know what I have for that? They're going to build a wall around them. We're going to be outside of the wall. We have to be very quiet when we get to heaven. Because <laughs> they're not going to know we're there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know what I mean? We're not, we're going to learn about the Gentiles and all that too. And it was taken up to, into heaven. Now while Peter wondered with himself what this, what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. You like that right there? There must have been a gate up front, couldn't get into the house, and they're yelling for Simon Peter. Right after the vision. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are speaking, seeking you. Arise, therefore go down and go with them doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Right there, the Holy Spirit is talking, right there. When Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek. For what reason have you come? I like that Peter always has to see why this, no, you know, it just, whatever. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by the holy angel to summon you to this house and to his to his house to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged with them. You like that right there? So this is Peter getting this vision of unclean and people are thinking it's about food and all of a sudden he's not even supposed to lodge with Jew. I mean um, Gentiles. The cool thing is, is if you look a little before, who was Peter lodging with? A tanner. They weren't even supposed to go around tanners. They weren't even supposed to have nothing to do with tanners. And Peter's at that house. On the next day, Peter went with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. 24. And the following day, they entered Caesar's Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. You like that right there? This guy summons Peter. He knows Peter through the Holy Spirit. God has shown him that he's going to speak to Peter. What a great audience. Right? He brings his friends and his relatives because he wants them to all hear it. That's how we should be. We should be speaking the Word and telling people about the Word, inviting everyone, not just people that you like, the people that you don't like. The common people. As Peter was coming into Cornelius, met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I myself am also a man. Right there. Peter didn't want none of this. We should never have no one worship us. They should only worship God, right? And Peter knew this. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jew, Jewish man, to keep company with or go to one another's nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You like that right there? Peter just straight tells him, straight up, right? He, you know, we don't know. Peter's always been a brute. But he should, he, I shouldn't even really be here. Right? 
but all he, you know, he's a little confused. It seems to me that because he was staying with the tanner. See, there's the conversion right there. Did you get what I meant? God had to show Peter because if you look at the Jews back in the day, they were all Christians, but they were still doing Jewish ceremonies in, in the temple. They were still living by the Jewish law. They were still saying that the centurions, the Ethiopians, um, Gentiles were unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, for four, four days ago I saw I was fasting until this hour and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house and behold a man stood before me in bright clothing speaking about the angel and said Cornelius your prayers has been heard and your alms are redeemed in the sight of God send for send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here whose surname is Peter he is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea when he comes he will speak to you so I sent to you immediately and you have dwelled you have done well to come now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded by commanded you by God I love that right there that they know that, that he has the answer you know what I mean <clears throat> then Peter opened his mouth and said in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality but in every nation who ever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Right there you've seen how Peter got converted right there that he learned that there is no common or unclean man. That's where Peter's conversion was. That he was stuck being a Jew in the Jewish faith and he wouldn't even have nothing to do with um, with Gentiles. We're going to see in chapter 11, Peter gets a little, gets handed by the Jews another trick bag. They were kind of tripping on him. Oh, you did what with the Gentiles? Right? This ain't for them. So if you want to read, if you, we want to learn more on this too, you could go to Ephesians chapter 2. And if we have time, we'll read that tonight. You know, and you'll see what Paul was saying about the Gentiles. But this is this had to blow Peter's mind, right? I like this right here. And the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judah and begun begun from Galilee after the baptism which John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power whom went about doing all good healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him and we are witnesses to all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but to the witnesses chosen by, before by God even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I like that right there that he's showing the death and resurrection of Jesus and he's saying that they ate with him. Remember on the beach when they ate with him? The fish? He's telling them all that right now, witnessing that he was there, showing the whole Jesus dying, you know, getting crucified, resurrected, 
And it's just awesome right there. <coughs> Where am I? Rose from the dead, 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. I like that right there. That no one's left out. It doesn't matter what color, what creed, where you're from, what part of the planet. Because you remember he says go out and preach all nations. the nations. And you can match this scripture up right there that I just read with John 3.16. Whoever, so whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Whoever believes in His Son in John 3.16, you can almost match it up with it. And those of the circumcised who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. You know, they were tripping. Right? Those Jews were tripping. They were like, man, what is going on here, right? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him, they asked him to stay a few days. And now we'll chew it up certain people, especially it's someone like, <clears throat> I gotta say, like going to Sturgis, right? And going places like that. You know, in our flesh, sometimes we have to look and you'll see people anywhere and you go, how could God save them? Has anybody ever thought that? As an early Christian? You don't have to lie. You don't have to put your hands up, but I know I've thought it. And people have thought it of me. People have looked at me and said, how is Kenny Pfeiffer saved? How did that man get saved? The only way is the Lord Jesus Christ. I've looked at people like that when I was a baby Christian. Oh man, God's got to do a lot of work with that. <laughs> Haven't you? Oh, sometimes we think that God's got to do it. All God has to do is just put someone in their way and open that man's heart and they're gonna, they can receive the gospel. That's our job to go out everywhere, especially, and everybody says, oh man, like we've seen in Isaiah. Oh, times are getting bad. Okay, yeah, it's getting bad. But has it ever been good with men? Yeah, we had it great in this country, but we had to look for those people and go out and love on them. You know, because God showed us grace and how we do it. But I love that that Peter, once he seen the vision, he was like, oh, yes, Lord, after. But at first he said no. You know, we have to have that heart for every single person that we come in contact with. <coughs> we have to get out of the flesh and we have to go in the spirit and let God move us. Because if we based it on their looks, their religion, creed, whatever, we get getting a big giant jam. I'll open it up. Just, it's just amazing that not only is Cornelius a Gentile, I mean, he's a Roman soldier. I mean, that's, you know, that's worse than a Gentile, you know, according to a Jew. I mean, the, the, between the Romans and the Jewish people, they pretty much hated each other. So for this guy to be a God-fearing man and the Jewish community loved him. I mean, that just got to be an amazing character, amazing man, you know, just alone. And to be so re receptive to the to the angel or the spirit that came to him without hesitation, without <coughs> anything, just obedient and uh, it's crazy, you know, just to think that a, a Roman soldier could have very well been, you know, Jewish. Just, just kind of pondered on that. It's like, wow, the, the faith that that Roman soldier had to be, to, loving, to love God of the universe and not 
all those Roman gods and all the things that the Romans prayed and worshipped. So, that's all. He needed Jesus. He was a god fair man, but he was still lost. And he wasn't a proselyte, because we've seen who the proselyte was. The Egyptian that cruised up there. He was just helping, you know, and um, in Caesarea, that's where all the big wigs lived for a little while. There's two Caesareas to be exact. One's up here, one's down here. I forget the names of them, but um, go ahead, Russ. Caesarea was a port, and it's just north. It's still there in existence today, and it's just north of uh, Tel Aviv. It's on the coast. And, and Cornelius was a bit of an oxymoron in himself because he was Roman. Um, number one. And number two, he had a belief in Jewish theology and was seeking the, the theology. And to top it off, he knew that there was something on top of that and was seeking salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, the footnote says, although he was not Jewish proselyte, Cornelius believed in Jewish monotheism and ethical teachings. In spite of the fact that he was devout, he still needed to hear the way to salvation. So he may have been following the Jewish belief, and he may have been a moral man, but in that he knew there was more. He knew that he needed Jesus. Um, the fact that the angel came to Cornelius in a time of prayer, which in the Jewish culture wasn't acceptable. Who are you to be praying and getting an answer? So more and more in the story, he was an outcast as far as the Jews were considered, even though they believed that he was a morally correct man. His own thoughts and his prayer time, seeking something more than what was in their culture, he was an oxymoron. Um, or he was different in the fact that he was seeking the salvation of Jesus Christ. Um, the fact that he was diligent in following the rituals, and it didn't say that he was following them in food, because part of this chapter is indeed about food, but he, he was following them in the culture of that time that three times a day, in fact, your Orthodox Jews still do it today, three times a day they pray, they kneel and they pray, and it's at a set time. <coughs> Um, he was obviously a, a moral man and that's why the, the angel came to him and spoke to him and told him to seek out Peter well if God wasn't in the mix of that that wouldn't have never happened in the first place God was setting up a story that would be the basis to instruct all that there was no longer partiality between one and the other which, if you think about the whole story, turns everything on its top. Because for those that were outside of Jerusalem, outside of the Jewish faith, this could never happen. They were that unclean. They could never come into the temple. They could never be a part of it. For Jesus to say, rise, Peter, kill, and eat, when the referral is about food, and Peter denying the Lord and saying, no, Lord, I'm not going to do this as Kenny eloquently put, Peter was always sticking his foot in his mouth. But it was always to prove a point to the rest of us who often stick our foot in our mouths, right? Anybody in the room not do that? Not in this room. And God says, but and God, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, at that metaphor at that moment was about food. But the overall of the story really has zero to do with food. It has to do with men and the partiality that one had against the other. So it's like in today's time, everybody, not everybody, but most people have that spirit of prejudice. And you can justify it with whatever's going on inside your head. Well, the culture was the same in those days, I'm sure both ways. On the Gentiles, it was, look at those righteous Jews that are doing this, 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 and this. Then the other side, the self-righteous Jews are going, look at these people. They can never even obtain righteousness. They can't get to heaven. You know what I mean? So they, both sides were in the midst of that. And in the midst of this, so was Cornelius to a certain ex ex extent. And obviously so was Peter. Not so, Lord, not me. 
So this is a great big picture on both sides of the screen. And they said, and, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear the words from you. Kenny pointed out he wasn't even allowed to go in that house. That was off limits. And this cat comes to you, and, and you've all had that guy that said, well, the Lord told me. Well, if it hadn't have been for the fact that the Lord had already spoken to Peter on the rooftop, it wouldn't have happened. The weird thing, another, another curious thing about this is the word for vision in the Greek, Greek interpretation is fantasy. He, he, slept, he slipped into a dream and he saw this fantasy. It was so unbelievable. Couldn't be real. But yet he woke up and he hears his name being summoned and he goes downstairs. And because he had just experienced that three times in a dream, he went and talked to the guy. Now this is humility. Because then Peter lifted him, or he said, and as Peter was coming in to, to meet Cornelius, he fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I am myself also a man. He didn't say, A servant of God. He says, I too am just a man. Now, think about that for a minute. He had just got through telling the Lord, No. Now he's meeting these people who he's not supposed to go to, and this cat's fallen down on his knees. I mean, if you really spend some time in this chapter, there's a whole lot of things here that, if you put yourself in either one of those shoes, wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit being in the midst of it. The following day they entered Caesarea, and now Cornelius was waiting for them and called everybody together, as Kenny pointed out. We should have that same passion. We should have that same desire in every opportunity when God puts you in a circumstance and you know it's going to be uncomfortable but you think I probably need to call some people in this is going to be good going against what your own fears are I'm sure it wasn't easy for Cornelius in the middle of that situation with everything that was going on to say let's get everybody in here maybe he felt like I don't want to be alone you know what I mean maybe that's just my twist and, they, and he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one another's nation. Now I found that ironic and I underlined that, that part of the passage because he's not just talking about what's going on right there. He makes a statement there. And he's talking about all nations, all tribes, all countries. Because this is the first time in Scripture where it is coming together with both sides and a precedence is being set. It is no longer just about the Jews. And here's proof. Introducing the Gentiles. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them for what reason have you sent for me? And then Cornelius answers. Here's something it says in verse 32, sent therefore to Joppa to call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. What is he speaking? The gospel. This is that time when the gospel is being presented to both sides. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Going back to that prejudice that we all hold on to. This right here should, should cause conviction, because it does me. Um, we just had an incident at, at my church and in the parking lot recently with my wife and an individual who was very, very rude after coming out of church. And as we got in the car to leave, it was a moment of, how dare them. And then all of those thoughts. And as we drove down the road, I got convicted and I told the wife, I said, you know, ultimately, we're responsible for our own closet. we got to clean our own closet. 
we all fall into that prejudiced mindset. That's the same thing this passage is about. Same exact thing. And the world today with all the craziness that's going on, it's real easy for us to point fingers at this, that, and the other thing. Ultimately, God calls us to be responsible for our closet and to love one another and to share the gospel everywhere to everybody, regardless. And if we're honest, we all got issues. We got a plank. <laughs> Big one. So that's where it convicted me. That's where this, especially this week, that's where this passage went. Who are we to judge? If I touch on one thing, like he said about Peter doing, going with them, and then, but I love how you see the Holy Spirit working on both men. And they come up. How many times have we heard, hey, I got a word from the Lord from you? The best thing which it, you know, and I've been guilty. Sure you do. I could hear from the Holy Spirit, right? What we should do is go, thank you, I'm going to pray on that. Right? Because it's happened to me lots of times. This lady handed me a piece of paper one time in this other church, and it said, be joyful, Kenny. This comes from the Lord. I was like, I'm, I'm joyful. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, I knew that one was true. There's a couple other ones. Uh, but um, I, lo <laughs> I love this that you know you see the Holy Spirit working on both their hearts and like we we're talking that you invited everyone I heard my sister Deb this weekend say I wish I was more bold well as we're talking to someone God sends us our way we don't always know what to say to them we can't just go hey you know the gospel we kind of like get to know them a little bit talk to them love on them and give them our testimony what God's done for us. And we wait for that opportune moment. If we see how the conversation goes, and God's going to set it up for for us to speak to that one person that He puts in our path. Correct? It always happens. So that's how we could be more bold, but we have to be gentle while we're doing it. We have to love on these people. And, you know, Peter just breaks it down and shows them and witnesses that he was hung on a tree, was buried for three days, and rose again, and he ate with them that he was alive. You know, and God has made us alive. So Peter's speaking the gospel, and, you know, the Holy Spirit falls, and it's not like they were like, well, you know, let's think about that. Well, I don't know. No, it was immediate. They all received it. You know, everybody that Cornelius had there, not just him, everybody just pretty much fell to their knees and received it. So, you know, that that in itself just you know, speak the gospel. It's you know It's the one that cuts to the heart. Yeah, share it. Hey, we've all been there. <clears throat> I don't care if you're white, black, green, orange, Chinese whatever Mexican we've all been there we've all looked at some but if you look at this prejudice that they were going through it was much more in the Jews and the Gentiles way more it wasn't that they went oh those people right they went ill those people they didn't want nothing to do with them zero zip they wouldn't even be able, they couldn't even touch them they couldn't even talk to them you know, and I know that, you know, we're going to run into all kinds of people, and our job is to what? Bring the gospel and love. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it ain't hard. But if you're filled with the flesh, it's going to be a trouble. It's going to be a... But if God tells you to go speak to that man or that woman, whatever, I advise you to only work with men if you're a man. I advise you to only work with women if you're a woman. Just telling you. Just saying. Ross then Mike. So 34 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. This whole passage in the study Bible, partiality is the only word that is in bold italic. Partiality, according to the Strong's Dictionary. A receiver of a face, one who takes sides, showing favoritism, exhibiting bias, 
showing discrimination, showing partiality, treating one person better than another, while society makes distinctions among people. That one's pretty heavy. God's love and grace are available for all and can be received by anyone. And we missed the best part, or in conclusion, two parts. And he commissioned us, 42, and he commissioned us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God, I got this underlined, to be judge of the living and the dead. Now, this is another piece of icing on the cake because it's saying there, Jesus, God, is responsible for judging the living and the dead. So it's not just from that moment, it was prior. So all of those holier than thou individuals in the church and synagogues wearing their robes, sitting in the front row, he was going to go back and judge them too. This turned everything on its top. And then it says, while, while Peter was still speaking those words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as you have? <clears throat> no partiality no more. There was no splitting between the two. The veil has been ripped. It's done. Saying that, I was sitting there thinking, you know, there's all kinds of different prejudices. But I think one of the ones that I harbor probably the most, and it just dawned on me tonight, and that's political party mm -hmm. discrimination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Bible says we're supposed to pray for them. No, I hear you. You know, mm -hmm. that I think one of the things that I was thinking about was. The, uh, the orchestration of God preparing Peter at the same time preparing Cornelius and, and arranging the meeting. As I look around this room, I, I'm pretty sure that every one of us has had an arrangement by God brought people into our lives that we didn't even know. We probably won't know this side of heaven, but it's it. You know, God is, is still, still working miracles. I look around this room, I see a couple guys in here that you know I was there to see. The, uh, the time when they had an, uh, an appointment with the Lord. Jeremy's one of them. Yes, sir. Dale's the other. I, I was thinking about that. You know, how many stories, you know, uh, God has ordained, you know, brought, like, for instance, you guys going to Surgers. You know, there was divine appointments there. I don't know what they were. You probably don't even know, but God sure does. And there's people that, that heard the gospel that, uh, that needed it, that, had no idea it was coming, and there it is. So it was. I, I remember you told me that you had given your testimony to a guy, several people, and it blew him away. You know, that's one of those appointments that in God's God's little book of stick, you know, he, he, that He keeps. That he's moving, still moving. What was a trip is we were standing in the front of the armory on Main Street, and I was witnessing to this guy, and I was with scooter from um, Sturgis and this older dude kept staring he just stared at me the whole time I was witnessing to this other guy and I wasn't ignoring him I kept looking at him and he just had this stare just stared at me and he had his hand on the rail and just started just staring at me and just staring and staring the whole time I witnessed this dude so when I was done talking to him I looked at him I said hey how are you doing he goes all real just like I don't know how to put the word like on sure and he goes how's it going I go good man how you doing what's your name he said Bob and his wife was by him there her name was Mary he goes my dad was a Christian 
I said, oh, that was aw that's awesome. My dad lived till he was 102 years old. And I was like, wow. And he goes, he got sick though and he died last year and he would have been 103. And then he goes, my dad was a total Christian, but he never, never, ever spoke the gospel to me. He would just say, hey man, you're doing wrong, boy. And it broke my heart. I looked at him, I said, really? I go, I'm living proof that God is alive. And he goes, I heard you. And he just still had that on shirt thing. And I said, hey man, blah, blah, whatever I said to him, I said, God loves you. Maybe your dad was going through things as a Christian. I don't know what your dad was going through. I don't know what he was going through with you. Maybe he didn't know how to get through to you. But who knows? But I'm going to tell you, God's alive and well. And then we talked for a little bit, this small talk, what his dad did and blah, blah, blah. And then the next day I'm in Rapid City and I see the same guy. And I said, hey, Bob, how's it going? And his whole demeanor was changed. He came up and gave me a big old handshake. His wife gave me a hug. Hey, Kenny, how's it going? Hey, man, good to see you. Oh, thank you for what you do out here in Sturgis. I was like, don't thank me, thank God. But it was just a trip. Like, he heard the whole thing when I was talking to another man. And we don't know if it hit him. So his name's Bob, pray for him, and his wife's name Mary. They were probably about 65, 70 years old. But it was a trip because when he told me that, that his dad never gave him the gospel, don't be that person to your neighbor. Don't be that person to your kid. Don't be that person to whoever. Always be ready in season or out of season to give the gospel, especially when the Lord's prompting you through the Holy Spirit. But I was thinking on the lines that he was thinking, but also other 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 kinds of prejudices that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Like b before I left the Bellagio, I was talking to a doctor that performed sex changes. And I so, that's when I felt so muzzled because I so wanted to say something about that. And uh, I hadn't heard that before because that hasn't been as prevalent and as outspoken as it is today. But but I have been praying for her, um, which because it was so just it just bothered me so much to have to sit and go uh huh uh huh you know. But during the time that I was speaking to her, I was definitely thinking, I hate you, you know. <laughs> and 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 so there's that that goes on, and then there's people in the store. You know, sometimes when I'm trying to get away without wearing my mask, and then the looks that I'm getting, like I shared with you guys a couple weeks ago. Yeah, there there are some prejudices that are that come up and that make us unapproachable, make put us into the, a fleshly mode. And I'm just speaking for myself, but that'll wake me up now from now on, which is what this is all about: getting together with family, encouraging encouraging each other in love and good works. Um, and I just love it's all always about appointments. It's it's. It, I mean, last week we talked about Ananias and Paul, and that was. A pivotal appointment, and then the Ethiopian is always the woman at the well, the Samaritan. But, um, but this appointment, I like. I mean, and I, I mean, it'll sink in more and more. This was just setting the stage for the the, the gospel to go out to the Gentiles for for <coughs> Paul's work, and mm -hmm. and making it a, a road for him to take Peter t to do that and for the same Holy Spirit of the same experience at Pentecost to occur now at this home. And I, I just love how much that sinks in this night, not even when I was studying, but just this night as we're all talking about it, just sinks in, sinks, sinks in even more. And uh, I just love how the two men uh, are appointed to pray at a periods of, uh, of specific periods of time um, I know that for myself, I share, shared it in, in here before that I like to make those appointments too with the Lord just because before when I was working, I had to make those appointments. I thought, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet with him on my days off because I had time. And now I have these um, more free time and I'm able to meet with him more. But but now I want to really just set a, set the stage to be available for for anything and everything, on purpose, more of a um, 
more of a proactive kind of listening kind of skill or a discipline. Um, I remember the night, the last time I saw my brother, uh, it was in the hospital after his um, LVAD uh, was failing or had just got put in, sorry. And he, it took him three days to have awakened from that. And he was, he was on the outs. But I remember the day before I left him, and I was with him for about four or five days just in the hotel room, but I warred the night that I left. I warred in the bathroom because I wanted, the Holy Spirit wanted me to pray for him, over him. And I was, I was warring because I was afraid my flesh was afraid that my brother would say no thank you or come against it and then it would shatter and I just I just prayed in the bathroom and it was such a battle um, but I came out I didn't know what I was gonna do and I I was the Holy Spirit allowed me to be bold enough to say Jonathan do you mind if I pray for you and he said no go ahead and that prayer was a divine appointment for my brother and I don't even know what I said but I know what I said and it wasn't what I planned to say like heal my brother take care of him what was let my brother cry out to you when he has no one and whatever it was was what I know that that God used one of the things because you know I love what I don't know was it Helen that said to us you might be the only Bible that somebody comes in contact with and at that, at that very moment, it was pivotal. And it, like Mike said, and like we know, it, it, is, it is essential that we're available. And Kenny's just a great example of that for me. I'm blessed enough to be married to him. But, because he's, he's, he'll make an appointment when there is none. So it's just, he just, he's always available. And I really admire that. And uh, I want to be more like that especially now that I can be because my time's not consumed working where I can't be so just to allude or, or go on what Jennifer just said as far as establishing the gospel to all men this is a pinnacle point in scripture and when I'm studying the word I'll read in the morning and I'll ponder it during the, my day and when God puts those things on my heart I'll go back to it and in one of the Bible apps on my desk at work. And the root word for prejudice is biased. We are biased as human beings about everything. And, and if you think about any of the struggles that you go through in life, the root of that is biased. That word fits my life and my frustration to a T. Um, and it can start over the simplest thing, the color of somebody's motorcycle. I'm biased. Or the brand. Or the brand. <laughs> Definitely yeah, especially the brand. The brand. Uh, <coughs> uh, and those are tools of the enemy. And we're looking at one of the most pivotal moments in Scripture when everything is getting turned on its head and the root of that to me and the message to me was it's biased we're biased with everything and that biased is the tool that God or that the enemy uses to divert our attention from our prayer time our study time and what's really important and making us ineffective in those divine appointments sometimes that are right there in front of us on a daily basis um, and with me, I'm chief sinner. I am biased about everything. So I, I, I think that it's important that, and Jennifer has pointed out she has more time to get in the Word now and spend more time with the Lord. I don't think we can spend enough time with the Lord. I really don't. At the end of Billy Graham's life, they said, what would you do differently? The man said, spend more time reading and spending time with the Lord. Yeah. The guy who was phenomenal in preaching the gospel and saving, leading people to Christ said I would spend more time with the Lord. All of the stuff that we work so hard for doesn't mean anything. The things that mean something is the time in the Lord, the, 
the learning in the Lord and sharing that with others without bias. I'm pretty sure you said this in the beginning, just listening to everybody, I can't remember fully. Obviously we know that this was this was the beginning of the missions for churches, without any doubt, because it was stepping out and sharing the gospel, which is what we're supposed to do and what our mission of, to do for God, and it's what churches have missions to go out to other nations to where the gospel hasn't been shared, where the Bible isn't available. So it was the beginning of all that. The other thing is, is there's nothing that's ever coincidental when it comes to meeting somebody and sharing the gospel. So every opportunity, whether we accept it or not, whether we do it or not, whether we take the time to engage in it or not, is an opportunity that God has appointed to use us. If we choose not to, if we fail for whatever reason, if we didn't take the time, if we became prejudiced towards that individual immediately, whatever it is, we failed God by not fulfilling what he's called us to do. And that's what we always have to keep in mind. Always. No matter what the circumstances, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. Um, and real quick, I'm going to share the story. The very first time I ever prayed for somebody at my job, the guy was in there with his little girl. He was taking her to the grandparents' house. He's going for cancer treatments. And I said, man, I, what's your first name? I want to keep you in prayer. God clearly told me to pray for this man. And as I'm walking through the dealership from service into the main part of the store and sales, I'm going, yes, so I, I'm definitely going to keep you in prayer. I want to pray with you. And God's telling me, pray with him now. Pray with him now. What are you waiting for? And I could hear God telling me this, but I'm looking around, and there are salespeople, and there are supervisors, and there's customers, and I'm thinking, I'm going to stop in the middle of the floor, lay hands on this guy, and pray with this guy. I know as soon as I'm done, I'm getting pulled in the office. I've pushed the limit with them because they knew how I was already as a Christian. I was very bold about it, but I had never taken that step yet. And when I heard God tell me again, I just looked at this guy and I says, listen, we're going to pray right now. And I closed my eyes and I laid my hands on him. And I, God just led me through a prayer. The Holy Spirit led me through a prayer. I couldn't tell you what I said. But when I got done and I said amen, he said amen, he embraced me. And I looked around and there was not one single person on the floor. No salespeople, no customers, nothing. It was like it was an empty store. It was me, this customer, and God while I prayed for him. And right then and there I says, Lord, I will never second guess or doubt or question again. When the opportunity is there, I will always do it. And that's how we have to feel always. That, like he said, I'll just elaborate on this and then we'll close. The cool thing is, is we're going to fail miserably at times. But Bernie didn't fail that time. You know what? We're human, and God's going to give us another opportunity. But we don't want to really miss those opportunities. And what my wife said, oh, I'm bold on this. It's only God that does it. Because I want to share what God has done for me in my life and radically changed me. It took about 10 years for me to get sanctified in one or two things. And then, you know, it just keeps going. But God's always going to show up if you're willing. And just be willing. Willing to just tell your testimony of what you know, what God's done in your life. You don't have to go above and beyond that. Just tell them what you know, what God's done for you. It doesn't have to be elaborate. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest, just like Peter. Just like all of them. And you can make a difference in this world. We don't have to be doing all this stuff that the mainstream world's doing. We have to do what God wants us to do. And one person at a time. Amen. You know, you never know who you're bringing to the Lord. That he might be some huge pastor bringing thousands of people to the Lord. But we have to be willing and ready and be used by God and not say, not so, Lord. We have to say, yes, Lord, what do I do? I uh, Just another thing to elaborate on what Kenny just said, that Helen taught us, our spiritual mom, 
don't worry about what you don't know because we're not going to know a lot. Wor worry about what you do know. And the very first per thing I did uh, personally was I went up to, I saw my best friend like the day after I met the Lord at the uh, clothing store. She was returning clothes like we used to do <laughs> just <laughs> to get money. But anyway, she was returning clothes and I go, Kristen, I have the answer. Uh, it's Jesus Christ. And that's it. And that's all I knew that day. And not saying that, you know, that was just, that's all you got to do is say what you do know. That's washing the disciples' feet. And of course, Peter, oh, no way. You're not going to wash my feet. Exactly. And Jesus said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And so I'm kind of seeing that here, Jesus is washing his feet again. He's washing off the prejudice. Mm -hmm. And preparing him for the people that are coming to his house. You know, and if, if God didn't prepare him, he probably would have looked out the door and says, no way, I'm not having this. But God prepared him and he washed, he washed some of that prejudice off and showed Peter, you know, to lighten up. And so when Peter went down, he was prepared. And You know, I like how God prepares us beforehand for things that we're going to do that he wants us to do mm. and I like the whole situation here is that God is confirming this whole situation by having both people separately he spoke to them separately so that when they came together they couldn't do anything but acknowledge that God is in this thing you know, so it's I like because God's always confirming what He's doing and what He wants you to do. And there will always be some kind of confirmation. And that's what I, I like about God because He, he kind of makes it easy for us. Mm. You know, He prepares us ahead of time and says, okay, go for it. And with that, I think we finished chapter 10. People are getting tired, sleepy. Hungry.